Hey all, uh, we are once again having a bit of a chat with uh, someone who has a significant level of expertise in teaching and learning in online environments. Uh, Professor uh, Martin Weller, he is with Open University out of UK. I've known Martin for uh, many years and he has been a uh, certainly a significant influence in, in uh, a number of uh, folks' background. He was uh, involved as uh, my supervisor uh, a number of years ago going through the PhD process and he's written extensively on what it means to teach, learn and engage in online environments. And a big part of our course focus is on the research and the research lens. So I'd love to hear more input from from you, Martin, regarding how that happens and what the research is that teachers may want to be aware of. But before we go there, how about just a quick introduction from you? What's your background and your role in this digital learning space? Yeah, hi, Jules. I'm Martin Weller. I'm based at the Open University in the UK, and I work in a place called the Institute of Educational Technology. Um, and so uh, my role in particular has been focusing on uh, open education. So I look a lot at OER, MOOCs, uh, those kind of things. But also, um, we might loosely call digital scholarship, which was kind of the, the use of new technologies by academics and educators. Um, but prior to that, um, I was the chair of the OU's first major uh, online course back in 99. that had about 15,000 students, and I was the OU's first uh, LMS director. So I've kind of come through the, the bog standard uh, ed tech route before getting to more of the open education route. Well, and so I think for for you, you know, you were fortunate to have sort of a career where you grew into that role, but many faculty in US, Canada, UK, Australia, you know, all over the world really are suddenly faced with a, you're moving online now. And so you don't have the luxury of going through a process. Now, admittedly, teaching 15,000 students in 1990s uh, online would be its own kind of a challenge. But if you were to reflect on both your experience and on your research in the digital learning space, what kind of advice would you give to teachers or instructors and support staff who are just now tasked with moving courses into the online environment? Yeah, it's tricky. I think I'm both very qualified and completely unqualified to give this advice because, the, you know, at the Open University, we often take a year, two years to produce a distance learning course rather than put your course online next week, which is a very different you know, prospect. So, but, um, so I think there are, not, but also I think people need to think in short term and medium to long term. I'm not sure we're going to be starting uh, the next semester in uh, autumn, fall, um, as normal. So people might well be delivering a lot of their stuff online anyway. And I think even once this goes away, there may be more of a shift to online. So I think there's part of you needs to stop, stop thinking about what I need to do for the next few weeks, but at the same time, putting in place the things to be affected down the line. So um, I guess if I was to give some tips out, I think, um, you know, don't just do the whole, here's, here's my one hour lecture online, um, and here are my slides, see you next week kind of thing. Because I think um, we really underestimate, so when we write our distance education materials, you know, they go through sort of critical review and this whole team, and we think we've been really clear about what people need to do, what the text says and that. <coughs> uh, but people will always misinterpret what you need to do when they're studying at a distance. So you need to be prepared to support students, you know, make sure you go back and explain things, you know, because it will get misinterpretation will happen. And once it happens, then it spreads like wildfire as well. So like, one person like comes up with a, a strange interpretation of something and then everyone else will adopt that and suddenly you know, people don't know what they're doing. So you need, you need to be much more sort of adaptable and flexible in that. Um, I think other sort of tips are things you, that, particularly collaborative activities that you can do in an afternoon, like face-to-face, take ages online. So imagine you're sort of doing some kind of group activity where people need to take on different roles and things. Um, you might do that in sort of three hours online because someone will go, well, I'll be the project manager. I'll be the resource finder. I'll do this. But actually just even negotiating who does what takes a long time online because someone may disappear for a bit. So be prepared for things to shift quite drastically. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, make use of open resources you know there are lots of open educational resource sites out there so at the OU we have open learn 
you know, really good quality stuff and you can find lots of stuff on YouTube that you can embed and get people to, and also get students to explore that. So try and take advantage of the affordances of the, of the medium. I, I appreciate, I you know, don't have a lot of time to do that now, but it's not just about replicating what you've been doing immediately online. It's about, okay, what else can I do that's different now and, and taking advantage of what's, what's offered to you. I'll stop there for yeah. my tips today. <laughs> no worries. Well, and and uh, the mindsets that I think faculty bring to this are critical as well. Uh, recognizing that there's nothing normal about this, and in many ways, there it may be a period of time, but it's not permanent either. And what I mean is, this isn't the course that you would like to teach if you had the instructional designers available that Open University has in the media studio and so on. This is. This is, for lack of a, of a better word or a more appropriate word, this is a type of triage. You're essentially trying to do the minimum that you can uh, mm -hmm. as quickly as you can while still addressing and meeting the needs of your students. Uh, for, so for, for teachers then who are in that environment and aren't going online, what kinds of tools or approaches would you use to get at that bare minimum? Because you, how do you create things like community connections or relationships or co-learning opportunities with students yeah. what kind of what technologies would you recommend i mean i think th this is not the time to start being fussy or fancy about technology it's like you know go with what you have and what works and what's fairly basic so you know, it's likely that you'll have a, an lms at your university but uh, maybe not at all schools and things so if that's available use that um you know and although i you know i, I hesitate to recommend it but um if, if people are already in Facebook, then, you know, use Facebook groups, you know, like I think in the short term, you might have to put aside some of our reservations about some of these things. Uh, the, the tool that you're using, Zoom, you know, ideal, you know, get set up and running. So you might want to run um, weekly drop-in sessions, you know, just say, look, I'll be online between seven and eight every Wednesday or something, you know, just so people can drop in informally and just check what they want to do and stuff. So I think having those sessions. Uh, and even just email lists, you know, or uh, asynchronous discussion forums, they're, they're all good, or tools like WhatsApp, you know, uh, just I think don't overcomplicate it. Use basic things that work, but equally you don't want to have 20 different communication channels where people might miss the basic things. So, you know, a simple website, VLE site, you know, that's the kind of home basis for things I think works. And, and that's something that's I've seen in a number of instances where I think some people who've labored in obscurity in the digital learning space for a while see this as a fantastic opportunity to start driving conversations. But this may not be the right time for that because I think you're 100% right. It's, it's different for different teachers and different faculty members and different support staff. What I mean by that is uh, if you are someone who has... Uh, an active profile on social media that may be a venue that you want to pursue with your students, assuming, of course, that you're aware and they're aware of some of the privacy implications of being in an open online setting. By the same account, you may find that the way you're going to teach is something as simple as an email listserv, some online resources that you share with students in the form of readings, and the weekly Zoom drop in session. Yeah. Someone else may go gung ho into an, an LMS or VLE if, if you're out in the UK, um, and they'll promote threaded discussions and a range of other approaches. So I think the key thing that, that you're touching on is once you've identified what you want to do with your teaching and learning, settle on a few tools and use those tools well rather than rolling out tool after tool after tool and losing students as you go, especially in larger class sizes. If you have 20 students, it's easier. If you've got 150, 200, 300 students or more in a course, it's going to be much more difficult. Uh, you said it better than I did, George. <laughs> I agree completely. And I think also people need to be sort of kind and considerate and hopefully students will be as well. You know, like a lot of people are learning as they go. And so you're trialing stuff. And if you have to do this again, come September, October, then maybe you'll have learned things that you want to, bring into it things that didn't work and that but you know i think it's you know, people need to be flexible and adapt to them great and a, and a final point i just want to hear from you uh, again you've touched on this a couple of times and there's i just want to share with others i know you have a book uh that's just out you've got numerous books that can be 
uh, freely accessed around the experience of teaching online and particularly your experience with educational technology. And there's a uh, recent work on sort of the 25 year landscape view of what that has been like in the education sector. And we'll certainly include those links following your video in the course, but you've also been heavily involved in open education resources and, mm -hmm. and the idea that there are curricular materials that are available that you can use often or generally without fee to support the learning experiences of your students. So maybe you could touch a little bit on, on that aspect. You know, certainly your 25 years of ed tech mm -hmm. overview and uh, OERs as well in this space. Yeah, I, thank you for the plug, George. I, I don't want to be an opportunity. <laughs> Now is the time to read my book, but uh, <laughs> but I do think in some ways um, I think you know you want to avoid Schadenfreude, but I think there is a kind of thing of like often online learning has been dismissed, and you know instructional design units, ed tech units have been moved around in universities and not yeah. supported well, <clears throat> and you kind of feel like some of that's coming home to roost now. So, and I do think a kind of a broader understanding of where edtech has been might have put us in a different place now. So, so yes, you do need to get my book on all of your uh, vice chancellors and principals' desks. Um, but I think you know, it does sort of show that, um, despite it having been around for twenty-five years plus, you know, like lots of people are still coming to it for the first time now. You know, so um, we, we hadn't really sort of put in place the kind of resilience and robustness in the uh, higher ed sector. I think that that should have been there. Um, and in terms of use of OER, yeah, I think that you know this might be a really good opportunity for OER to kind of show their usefulness because there, there, there are lots of MOOCs around. People are running those. You're running one, uh, but often MOOCs aren't adaptable. The good thing about OER, so um, I pointed some people. So, for example, at, um, at the University of the Open Learn, we have an existing course which is take your teaching online. You know, ideal, <laughs> and so that's already there. But it, the thing is, because it's Creative Commons license. Uh, it's available in download formats and that people can take it and adapt it for their for their institutions i think that's the the key part here is not as so much necessarily individuals taking it but each institution taking stuff and adapt adapt it to their particular needs and i think this is where the the reuse will sort of come into play quite a lot very well thanks very much uh, martin for taking uh, time out on such short notice to to share your insight with uh, with the Students in our program, I think, especially the, we, we don't know how long we're here. I think that's one of the things that's interesting. And uh, the longer we're here, obviously, the deeper the expertise uh, individuals can develop. And by here, I mean in this digital learning, remote teaching, whatever space that's been foisted upon many faculty. Uh, it, it's, and, and the one thing I've found, especially as I've had conversations with faculty now moving into this space is, many aren't aware of just how rich the existing research base is, how many of the questions they're facing have already been evaluated, assessed, and researched going back 30, 40, or even 50 years in some instances. So I uh, certainly appreciate you uh, spending a bit of time with us and we'll share your resources with the participants in the course. And I'm sure they'll find them as, as useful and insightful as I have. Appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, George. Good luck, everyone.